Hello and welcome to Smash Down Audiobooks. This is the first chapter in a long story. Uh, this one is entitled and dedicated to the Smashcast podcast group. And this book was recommended by them. This is Moby Dick, a classic, uh, The Adventures of a Whaler, and The Creed of the Whaleman in Tow. We'll be starting on chapter one. There will be no prologue. Um, you can look it up if you wish to read it yourself. It's mostly just Bible quotes. Chapter 1. Loomings. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse, nothing in particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have driving off of this plane. And regarding the circulation, Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the streets and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I count it high time to get to the sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Kato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men, in their degree, some time or another, cherish very neatly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. There now is the insular city of the Manhattoes, belted round by whales, wharves, as Indian isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. Its extreme downtown is the Battery, where the noble mole is washed by the waves and cooled by breezes which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circum... Circumvolate. City of the dreamy Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corley's Hook to Coenty's Slip, and from there, hence by Whitehall, northward, what do you see? Boasted like silent sentinels all around the town, Stand thousands upon thousands of the mortal men fixed in the ocean reveries. Some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pier heads, some looking over the bulwarks, bulwarks of the ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging, as if striving to get a still better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen, of weekdays, pent upon lath and plaster, tied to the counters, nailed to the benches, benched to the desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? Or do they hear? But look! Here comes more crowds, pacing straight for the water, and seemingly bound for a dive. How strange! Nothing will content them with the extremest limit of the land. Loitering under the lady, the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, no, no. They must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues inlanders all. They come from lands and alleys, streets and avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnific magnetic virtue of these needles of the compass of all those ship attract them there? Once more, say you are in the country, in some high land of lakes, there are almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged into the deepest revelries. Stand that man with his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water, if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be an Arthas in the great American desert, try this experiment. If your caravan happens to be supplied with a metaphysical professor, yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. But here is an artist. He desires to paint you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of a romantic landscape in all the Valley of Seiko. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each within an element, a hollow trunk as if a hermit and a crucifix were within, and here sleeps his meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into the distant woodlands winds a mazy way, reaching to the overlapping spurs of mountains bathed in their hillside blue. But though the picture lies thus tranced, and though his pine tree shakes down and sighs like leaves upon the shepherd's herd, yet all were vain unless the shepherd's eyes were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June. 
When for scores on scores of miles you wade knee-deep among tiger lilies, what is the one charm waiting? Water. There's not a drop of water there. Were Niagara but a contract of sand, would you travel your thousands of miles to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of silver, deliberately weather to buy him a coat which he sadly needed, or invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust, healthy boy with a robust, healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to the sea? Why, upon your first voyage as a passenger, did you yourself feel such a mystic vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity and in the own brother of Jove? Surely all this is not without meaning, and still deeper the meaning of the story of Narcissus, who believed that he could not grasp the tormenting, wild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned with that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and this is the key to it all. Now when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea, whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to have my own conscience of lungs, I do not mean to have and infer that I ever go to the sea as a passenger. For to go as a passenger, you must need a purse, and a purse is but a bag, unless you have something in it. Besides, passengers get seasick or quarrelsome, don't sleep at night, do not enjoy themselves much. As a general thing, no, I never go as a passenger. Nor, though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to the sea as a commodore or a captain or a cook. I abandon the glory and distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abdicate all honorable respect, toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself, without taking care of ships, barquies, brigs, schooners, and what not, and as for going as a cook, though I confess there is a considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer on shipboard, yet somehow I never fancied broiling fowls, though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and dramatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully and to say, reverently, of a boiled frau that I am. It is out of the adulterous things and dotings of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bakehouses, the pyramids. Now, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor. Right before the mast, plumb down to the forest castle, aloft there to the royal mast ahead. True, they rather order me about some, and make me jump from spar to spar like some sort of grasshopper in a May meadow, and at first this sort of thing is unpleasant enough, it touches one's sense of honor. Particularly, if you come of an old established family in the land, and the Van Rensselaers, or Randolphs, or Harding Canthers, the more than all, if you just previous to putting your hand into the tar pot, you have been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in all of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from a schoolmaster to a sailor and requires a strong dosation of the Seneca, and those Stoics, to enable you to grin and bear it, but even this wears off in time. What of it? If some old hunks of the sea captain order me to get a broom and sweep down the decks, what does that indignity amount to, Wade, I mean? And the scales of the New Testament? Do you think the Archangel Gabriel thinks anything the less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey the old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. When then, however, the old sea captains may order me about, however they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is alright, that everyone else is in one way or another served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is, and so the universal thump is passed round, and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades and be content. Again, I always go to the sea as a sailor, because they make a point of paying me for my trouble. Whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I have ever heard of, on the contrary, passengers themselves must pay, and there is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two orchid thieves entailed upon us, but being paid will compare with it. 
the urbane activity with which a man receives money is really marvelous, considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly eels, and that on no amount can a honeyed man enter heaven. Ah, how cheerfully we consign ourselves to the perdition. And finally, I always go to the sea as a sailor, because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For as in this world, head winds are far more prevalent than winds from astern. That is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim, so for the most part of the Commodore on the quarter deck gets the atmosphere at second hand from the sailors in the forecastle. He thinks and breathes it first, and not so, and much the same way do the commonly lead their leaders and much other things at the same time the leaders little respect it. Though, wherefore, it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I should now take into the head to go on a whaling voyage. This is the invisible police officer to the fates, who has the constant surveillance of me, and secretly dogs me and influences me in some unaccountable way. He can better answer than anyone else, and doubtless my going on this whaling voyage formed part of the grand program of providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came in as a sort of brief interlude, and solo between more extensive performances, I take that this part of the bill must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States, the whale voyage by one Ishmael, the bloody battle in Afghanistan. Though I cannot tell you why it was exactly that those stage managers of the fates put me down in the shabby part of a whaling voyage, when others were set to the more magnificent parts and high tragedies and short and easy parts and genteel comedies, the jolly parts and farces, though I cannot tell why this was exactly, yet now that I can recall all the circumstances, I think I can see a little into the springs and motives which being cunningly presented to me under various disguises induced me to set about performing the part I did, besides cajoling me into the delusion that I was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself, such a preposterous and mysterious monster roused all curiosity in the wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk. The undeliverable, nameless perils of the whale these, with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds, helped to sway me to my wish. With other men, perhaps, such things would not have been inducements, but as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting inch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I am quick to perceive a horror, and could still be social with it, would they let me since it is but well to be the friendly interns of the inmates of the place one lodges in. By reasoning with these things, then the willing voyage was wholesome. Welcome! The great floods of the wonderful world swung open, and the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, two and two, there floated into my inmost soul, endless possessions of the whale, and made most of them all one grand hooded phantom, like snow in the air. And this concludes Chapter 1 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Thank you for listening to the first Smash John audiobook. I hope you enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I know that my cadence is a bit off, and I'm sorry I did mispronounce and stutter a bit. It is the first uh, recording, and I don't have the energy to really go back and re-record this whole 14-minute ordeal. Uh, but you really, uh, it really amazes me that you guys stuck around, and thank you very much for your uh, service.